way. So in terms of geopolitical shifts of power, there was a swing westward. And uh, the global neoliberal regime, which we're still uh, living under now, uh, globalization completed in the ideological sense when there was no longer two systems contesting each other. But there was one system and all the states were trying to integrate <coughs> into that system in one way or another. So without the end of the Cold War, without the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the global neoliberal regime would not have formed. It would have remained unfinished, incomplete. So in the 1990s, we saw this triumph not only of global capitalism, but also of neoliberalism. But then came the second period. And that was when the US hegemony was tested. And it was ushered in by the attacks of 9-11. And the emergence of the Islamist challenge. Uh, people began to compare radical Islam with, the, with communism. You know, like in the Cold War, the communists were challenging the Western dominance. And now that the communists have folded up, transformed themselves into capitalists of one kind or another, uh, it was radical Islamists who were uh, waging a global contest with the West. Uh, and the United States, led by <coughs> President Bush, responded in a certain way. In the meantime, uh, it was increasingly clear that the world was not going to be unipolar. It was becoming increasingly multipolar. Part of that multipolarity was the unexpected resurgence of Russia, just as unexpectedly as the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Russia, which many experts were already writing off as an important force in global politics, looking at the transition crisis, the various problems that Russia uh, uh, was experiencing, were predicting that Russia was kind of could be written off. And that was, by the way, reflected in the way uh, people in Washington were thinking about Russia. Uh, a defeated power, a uh, humiliated power, a uh, country which had trouble sorting itself out. And so you, you really didn't have to care about Russia except one thing, loose nukes. You know, chaos <laughs> in a country with so many nuclear weapons is uh, problematic for uh, a number of reasons, but loose nukes. And so non luger initiative or cooperative threat reduction legislation, which was designed at that time, uh, resulted in the Americans paying the Russians to keep their uh, nuclear weapons in a more secure way. Uh, that was the, the primary concern. Uh, parallel with Russia's resurgence, we saw the decline of US hegemony because the United States, which confidently rode into the greater Middle East uh, in 1991, was increasingly stuck, unable to win. Even such a seemingly a uh, modest task as capturing the big bad Osama bin Laden was still uh, an elusive goal. And then came the third period and it was ushered in in 2008 uh, with the, uh, uh, the real dramatic stage of the global financial crisis which then became a global economic crisis in a wider sense. What are we seeing in this third period? We are seeing creeping bankruptcy and political stalemate in the United States. Remember the mood in 2008 when the Americans elected President Obama with great hopes that with a more enlightened leadership, uh, this country would be able to deal more realistically and effectively with the problems that it faces, as well as the, some of the problems of the world. Uh, in the meantime, in Europe, there was not much uh, to boast about because the European integration project is encountering deepening problems. Europe it has not yet seen the worst of it. Europe has not yet sorted out the, the problem in which, uh, which, which they're encountering and uh, uh, the uh, uh, if, uh, if we compare European problems with the problems of the United States, it's hard to say which problems are worse. Now, with the United States, the problems are worse for all of us 
because of the continuing dominance of the dollar in the international accounts. Uh, and uh, if the dollar goes belly up, uh, it's really, we, we are going to have uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, troubling developments in the global economy, which will hit everyone. In the meantime, China increasingly, uh, by the way, uh, I remember discussion among China experts uh, in the 1990s. They were saying, yes, China doing well economically, but politically it's still an authoritarian state. So, but looking at the results of the changes in Eastern Europe and Russia, it's very likely that China will follow suit. Capitalism and democracy, uh, democracy of a liberal kind, so China will not be able, the Communist Party is a thing of the past, uh, it's, it's likely to be overthrown in one way or another, May, maybe give up power voluntarily. Uh, but China continued to rise as communist China, even though it's an open question to what extent you can call it a communist state, but then we call, we, we've called all those states communist states, not because they reached this utopian stage of communism that Marx called for, but uh, because of the simple fact that the parties calling themselves communist parties were in charge of those countries. They controlled them. And China continued, whether it is capitalist or socialist, it is under one party control. And the biggest, the world's biggest communist party doing pretty well and not about to relinquish power, if only because it's viewed as an effective uh, government for, for the uh, fastest growing economy in the world. So what a transformation from the earlier uh, uh, views of China. Uh, and then another interesting thing that occurred in the third period was uh, a trend toward closer cooperation between Russia and the West. In the previous period, uh, when Russia was resurgent and the United States was, began to experience signs of decline, uh, we saw the buildup of tensions between Russia and the United States, Russia and NATO, Russia and the European Union. And uh, the interesting thing of the third post-Cold War period is that that trend gave way to the opposite trend, uh, seeking ways to forge stronger links, uh, reaching a higher level of integration between Russia and the West as part of evolving new responses to the crises which are besetting the world system. Uh, I'd like to remind you a few things about Russia. It's a big country, the world's biggest country. It has uh, as its state symbol uh, something which uh, until uh, the Turks conquered Constantinople was on the flags of the Byzantium uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. And by the way, uh, those of you who have been to Greece might have seen those yellow flags with black double eagle. That's the flag not of Greece, but of the Universal Orthodox Church of Constantinople. Some Greek churches still recognize the primacy of the Universal uh, Orthodox Church. So uh, you, can see, you can see the double eagle there. Uh, it's, it's a huge country, and it has uh, this uh, very important location because it's at the very heart of the, sub, of the supercontinent of Eurasia, kind of binding together Europe and Asia and occupying the heartland, as uh, was described by the great geopolitician Alfred Mackinder 100 years ago. It has uh, at least one-third of the world's minerals and fresh water. Its economy is world's seventh largest. By the way, it's seventh largest creditor to the United States. That's another uh, change, you know, from 1990s when the Russians were borrowing money like crazy, going deeper and deeper into debt, and today they are crediting, they're putting their money into the U.S. securities, helping finance uh, the American uh, budget deficit. Uh, it's, uh, it occupies a, an important place in terms of uh, transportation networks across Eurasia. And of course, it's still one of the two biggest nuclear powers, and it, uh, it's also major, one of the two major space powers. Uh, the Russians are preparing moon flights 
and Mars flights, just as the Americans are, and uh, there's still enough technology there, and there's uh, enough money there to finance uh, such projects. So, and the International Space Station is continuing to function only because the Russians can provide the trucks uh, to carry stuff to the station. Uh, nobody else can do it. Russia is a permanent member of UN Security Council, member of GH, G20. It's also interesting that Russia has more neighbors than any other country in the world. The second uh, most neighborly country is China. China has 11 neighbors, Russia has 13. But China's neighbors are conveniently located uh, in uh, you know, one corner of Asia, whereas Russia's neighbors are all over the place. <coughs> From Norway at one end to the United States at the other, it's uh, Russia by definition, by the virtue of geographical location, is involved in so many different uh, uh, aspects of contemporary international relations. So running Russian foreign policy, managing Russian foreign policy is an exceedingly difficult task. Uh, let's look at the Russian economy, compare it with the Canadian economy. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the real gap is in GDP per capita. So, the average Russian is less productive than the average Canadian. So, productivity remains an issue in the Russian economy, but, but the rate of growth has been quite, uh, quite impressive. Although, on the other hand, if you look at the figure for 2009, when the Russian economy contracted by 7.9%, compared to Canada losing 2.5%. That's quite a, quite a contrast. So Russia was growing very rapidly, and then, as a result of the global financial crisis, it just tanked. But another surprising thing, and uh, the economists learned a few important things about the differences between the way the Russian economy works and, say, the German economy works was that the rapid recovery, because conventional economic models were predicting that having lost 7.9% in, in 09, the Russians were likely to be sluggish for a few years before they will regain economic growth. Yet in the following year, the economy grew by 4%, and then last year by 4.3%. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of wild swings. Uh, in recent years, uh, people began to talk about Russia's resurgence. Resurgence. And if you compare what Russia was like in the 1990s, when it lost half its economy, when it was falling deeper and deeper into debt, when capital was flowing out of Russia, privatization of state property uh, was followed by the money leaving Russia rather than being invested in Russia. So tremendous capital flight, also tremendous brain drain. An estimated half a million scientists and scholars have left Russia in the past 20 years. That's an enormous, the, over the period of the Soviet Union, the, 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 so, the, the Russians, the Soviets had, had built a, a, a very impressive uh, capacity in science, technology, and education. And uh, as a result of the crisis of transition, uh, a very large part of that potential was uh, at least partially lost to Russia. And uh, that, of course, has long-term consequences for the future of the Russian economy. The new state which emerged following the collapse of the Soviet Union, while putatively democratic and recognized as kind of getting there, becoming democratic by the West, was actually a, a very poorly organized state, a, st a virtual state in many ways, uh, with characteristics of feudalism, chaos. Uh, the, the democratic facade was more of a facade than the substance of, of how Russia was, was governed. And there was uh, a real possibility in the late 1990s that Russia might actually follow the way of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union broke up into 15 independent states. So now Russia, because of all those crises, was likely or could, could break up into, into pieces. And in fact, one part of Russia, the Republic of Chechnya, proclaimed independence. And when the Russians tried to 
compel the Chechens to return to the fold and send the forces to the Chechnya in December 94, uh, it resulted in a failure. So a powerful nuclear uh, armed state failed to subdue a, a very, very small armed insurgency in one of the regions of, 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 of the Russian Federation. Uh, in fact, it is interesting to recall that as late as 2000, the year 2000, 2001, experts in the United States, such, in places such as RAND corporations, were discussing possibilities. They were talking about scenarios, and they were looking at the possibility that Russia would break up. And there were people who were writing papers on the topic of the modalities of stationing American troops in the territory of the Russian Federation if central control uh, breaks down and there is a civil war. And uh, if all that happens in the midst of tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, then the United States would be uh, absolutely compelled to intervene militarily to restore some kind of an order and secure the nukes. <coughs> Uh, we all know that there is a similar scenario now with regard to Pakistan, right? Great concern that Pakistan, if it goes out of control, uh, might, uh, might become dangerous, and so there are contingency plans uh, to secure the new. So uh, it was interesting that it's, it got really that bad in 1999-2000. So relations, can you imagine how history would have unfolded if indeed Russia had broken up, if the central government in Russia in 1999-2000 had collapsed and the United States troops would be stationed in Russia as a peace, <laughs> peacekeeping establishment or whatever, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yet that was one of the scenarios. Uh, and. Uh, it seemed that Russia was beyond repair, and then things began to change. Just look at one curve showing uh, Russia's resurgence. The economy going down, 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 and then starting up with, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, continuing, actually. So uh, it's not just the size of the economy, it's also GDP per capita, and that translates into personal income pensions and uh, social benefits and uh, other things. So the perception that uh, the standard of living is improving and the conditions of life becoming, are becoming less unbearable and for some people quite, quite very, very bearable uh, is, uh, has grown in Russia in recent years. Just let me quote from this study by the U.S. National Intelligence Council. In October 2008, uh, they described Russia as one of the four rising centers of international power. In terms of size, speed, and the directional flow, the transfer of global wealth and economic power now underway, roughly from west to east, is without precedent in modern history. No other countries are projected to rise to the levels of Russia or China, India, or Russia, and none is likely to match their individual global clout. Growth projections for Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the BRICS, indicate uh, that they will collectively match the original G7's share of global GDP by 2040-2050. Given the situation in Europe and in the United States, that uh, benchmark may be reached <coughs> sooner than 2040-2050. Because this continuing shift of the center of gravity in the global economy from west to east is speeding up. I mean, of course, you can never, you can never expect that all the trends will continue to unfold uh, the way they have in, uh, uh, in, in recent years. So uh, things may change at any point, but uh, this is how this is how the experts uh, uh, were positioning Russia on the global scale of, of power and influence. Now, people like to say that it's all about oil, and uh, the, uh, the rise in oil prices uh, lifted all the boats in Russia and created this prosperity and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, energy exports are a major uh, 
source of wealth for Russia. And uh, uh, there's no denying that, but at the same time, uh, an economy, a country, is a very complex mechanism, and it's not just the pipelines that allow the country to grow uh, the way Russia has and to, be, to, become, uh, to overcome some of the crises which uh, they experience. It has to do with the role of the state. Without the role of the state, you cannot have, uh, without the state being restored, repaired to some extent, in some fashion or other, you cannot have that kind of a recovery. And uh, the rebuilding of the state which occurred in Russia uh, was done quickly, and it was done by rather crude uh, authoritarian methods. Not entirely by authoritarian methods, but of course uh, at the expense of liberal democratic norms. So you had Russia evolving into a more authoritarian fashion, even as it was being resurgent. And so people were, could say, the Chinese were applauding, because that's, that's what they always said. When Gorbachev came to Beijing, at the time, the Tiananmen Square was still occupied by the student. It was an embarrassing moment, because Gorbachev thought uh, that, uh, of course, with this kind of manifestation of popular activism and unrest, the government has to open up to democratization. What, after all, the students were not demanding the overthrow of the Chinese Communist Party. And indeed, the crackdown, the tanks moved into the Tiananmen Square after Gorbachev left. But the contrast between, and I remember, I remember that spring very vividly, I was proud that we, the Russians, were doing things differently. And then later, uh, during the 90s, when, when Russia was, seemed to be beyond repair, the Chinese were wistfully reminding the Russians that uh, the market economy and authoritarian governance can actually go very well together. And the market economy and democratic governance can interact in so many dysfunctional ways that you may lose both. So, uh, in the years of the Putin regime, uh, you could say, hey, you know, you, perhaps authoritarianism still has uh, validity, or still has, uh, that, that it can do things, at least for a while, at least in some places, as opposed to others. Let's face it, the Putin regime has consolidated Russian capitalism, which was, by the way, in real danger of being overthrown at the end of the Yeltsin term in office. The way Russian capitalism was installed uh, could, not, uh, could not be sustained. First of all, it could not be implemented without a crackdown on democracy, which started under Yeltsin, not under Putin. And it could not be secured without the creation of a stable authoritarian regime. So Putin and the Russian authoritarianism is the price that the Russians continue to pay for a rapid transition to capitalism, and uh, capitalism of a particular kind. <coughs> and we shouldn't forget that Putin was pretty much chosen and appointed by the Russians, all Russian oligarchs to do exactly that, to save them from a revolution. So the, the regime protected uh, the new Russian ruling class from internal challenges and it also returned Russia to the ranks of major international uh, players. Yeah, uh, George Bush, by the way, admired Putin. But he, I mean, he, of course, did not agree with Putin on everything, but they were, they understood each other so well. And, and uh, you know, Bush thought primarily in terms of whether Russian capitalism could be secured or not, and if Putin was doing a good job securing and consolidating Russian capitalism, that must be a good thing. He's a stand-up kind of guy, as we say in Texas. Uh, he famously said at a press conference about Putin. Okay, what were the costs of that success? Uh, the Russian bureaucracy today, in terms of numbers, is twice as big as at the times when the Communist Party was in charge and the country was still socialist, state socialist. And everybody was complained about the heavy hand of bureaucracy. Now, isn't that interesting? You make your transition to a free market economy from state-owned economy, 
<laughs> the numbers of the bureaucrats double as a result. And not only the bureaucracy is big, it's a different kind of bureaucracy. This is a bureaucracy which views itself as uh, agents of capitalism. These are people who are very strongly focused, uh, I mean by and large, I'm not saying about every civil servant, most of them just doing their job, but the people with really significant administrative power in their hands are committed to using that power to enable them to become richer, to acquire some kind of a capital, to enter into some kind of lucrative deals. If you don't do that, then you're no good. And if a milieu, a bureaucratic milieu, is permeated with this kind of acquisitiveness, this enterprising mentality using your office as, as your business, uh, then imagine uh, how it feels if you are a bureaucrat who wants to be honest and wants to do his or her job. Uh, you will not survive in such an environment. So that's the kind, that's the price of bureaucratic capitalism, that the corrupt, uh, bloated bureaucracy, which uh, controls uh, so much, and uh, which is uh, very little, uh, uh, which is almost unaccountable. And of course, the core of this new bureaucratic structure that controls Russia are the people who, are, who came from the various branches of the Russian security services. Or you can call them KGB Inc. because it's about capitalism now and, and it's not the, about the ranks and not just about the people who are currently serving in places like Federal Security Service. In fact, they are most likely to be doing their job as they're supposed to. But those who are no longer in the service have used whatever connections they had and whatever uh, resources they have to become players in, in the new Russian capitalist economy. And there were many of them. And of course they have connections and uh, Putin came to power as a leader of that particular elite. And in fact it was obvious, it, it wasn't accidental that it was a KGB crowd that was called upon to save Russia, which was on the brink of collapse. If the KGB cannot do it, then who can? And uh, in the words of one of the uh, leaders of, of this elite, uh, uh, Russia was falling into precipice, but at the, at the last moment, the hook of the KGB uh, snagged Russia. So Russia was falling and it got snagged on the hook of the, K <laughs> of the KGB. So we saved Russia. We, we provided the hook. That's the way he described it. Uh, in the third post-World War period, starting with about 2008, uh, and uh, especially against the background of the economic crisis when things began to change, and uh, when Putin was no longer president, and there was a new president, Medvedev, even though he was uh, a, a junior player in the new diarchal regime, dual power regime that, that was created as a result of the elections of 2008, more, more and more Russians began to think about alternatives to Putin. So they could say, okay, this hook, this uh, arrangement which we created in order to save Russia from, from the crisis has worked for a while, but now uh, we really must move on to something else, something which would work better because we cannot continue to rely on this system that was created under Putin. First of all, you need to modernize the economy and for that you need to move toward the development of high-tech industries. Uh, you need to rebuild infrastructure. Russia continues to live on the basis of the infrastructure that was built in the Soviet years. In the last 20 years there's been very little infrastru new infrastructure that was built. And some of the, some of the uh, elements of this uh, dilapidating infrastructure are really scary if you look at it. So massive investment in that is necessary. Uh, but even more importantly, social investments. Do you know how much a professor in Russia makes on the average? We've just seen uh, this new table published, was uh, publicized in Toronto Papers, an international study comparing the pay of professors in various countries and uh, uh, 
A Russian professor on the average makes one-tenth of what a Canadian professor makes. And, and that is uh, really uh, threadbare, given the fact that the prices uh, uh, in Russia are in some ways comparable to the prices here. So this impoverishment of the intellectual class, this uh, uh, hungry rations on which the, uh, the uh, 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 creators of the future economy uh, are, are kept uh, is really uh, unbearable. It cannot continue unabated. Uh, health, education, welfare, all kinds of social programs which have not been funded uh, in the past 20 years because they were not supposed to, because there was this uh, uh, conviction that whatever the state does, it is likely to do badly. Whatever the market does, it's likely to do well. Private initiative, the capitalists, they are the makers of modern society, not the bureaucrats. Uh, in fact, it's really odd to talk to some of the leading Russian intellectuals on the liberal side because they, you know, they feel most comfortable in the milieus like the Heritage Foundation uh, in the United States. Uh, not the Brookings Institution, not to mention the more liberal think tanks, but, but Heritage Foundation, because these are the people who really know what they're talking about, because you need free market. You need a free market. And the state needs to shrink as much as possible. So that's what, the, uh, by the way, the uh, triumph of neoliberalism meant in, in, the, uh, in, in the context of Russia, uh, that the state has shrunk. The state has shrunk. The state has abdicated its responsibility for the welfare of citizens. The citizens, the citizens were invited to uh, take care of themselves as best they could. Uh, if you want to go into business, go ahead and do so. Uh, if you want to leave the country, you feel free to do so. Nobody is holding you. It's a free country. Do whatever you want. Nobody is responsible for the others. Uh, there. Russia today is number one in the world in terms of the social inequality. Now, social inequality, as you know, has become a global concern. Increasingly, we see the recognition of this fact that the distribution of wealth on the global scale on this planet has never been as unequal as it is today. This is really unprecedented. Never before have we seen such a maldistribution of wealth. Well, against that background, Russia is the least equitable country. And it jumped to this situation, to this you know, place of pride, of being number one. Uh, Brazil is number two. Uh, it jumped from being one of the more egal most egalitarian countries. So stories about the privileges of Soviet bureaucrats under socialism, Oh my goodness, these people, they have so much, and, 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 and the common people, the workers, you know, they earn. I mean, this is really incomparable. The nomenclatura privileges in the Soviet Union and the privileges, uh, and the, the enormous wealth controlled by the Russia's, Russian new oligarchs are just incomparable. Not to mention the fact that the Russian oligarchs are free to play with their wealth as they see fit. If they want, they can take it out of the country. If they want, they can transfer it in various uh, forms of power. Uh, Nomenclatura did not have such, uh, for such freedom. They were not free. One of the reasons why they supported neoliberalism was because to them it meant freedom. Freedom to utilize their power and turn it into wealth. So Russia is facing a huge challenge, redistribution of wealth. By the way, uh, have you seen the uh, results of the most recent Environics poll in Canada concerning inequality and distribution of wealth? It's very interesting that contrary to what we hear from our government and uh, the conservative intellectuals in this country, the majority of Canadians not only are concerned about, about growing inequality, but they are in support of raising the taxes on the rich and raising the taxes in general in order to fund the various programs that the government uh, should be responsible for.
So uh, the and of course in the United States, the redistribution of wealth through taxation, uh, taxing the super rich is is one of the issues. Obama has already positioned himself as somebody who's going to put squeeze on the rich and to do a little bit of redistribution. So in Russia, that is a crucial uh, point in the changes which are necessary. And again, you also hear similar proposals concerning taxation and so on and so forth. But can, all, can any of that be done without reforming the state? And if the state is as dysfunctional as it is today in Russia, can any kind of a project be successfully implemented? And can the state be reformed without democratization? Those are the questions that people are asking, but until last winter, there was a sense that Russia was stuck in a conservative, semi-frozen political state. But people had become very private. They were so thoroughly disappointed with the results of democratic change. Uh, it went, well, that went so badly, and uh, they were so cynical about uh, uh, the uh, motives of those who governed them, and they were so uh, disappointed about their own ability to change anything in their country that they withdrew into their own personal lives. And then came December of 2011, the winter of Russian discontent, which has shaken the Russian state, the Russian ruling class, the Russian society, it did not result in the defeat of Mr. Putin and his bid to become president for the third term. But it has put the Russian politics, the Russian political scene, the Russian society in a different mode. So the real meaning of these changes is that the citizens at some point decided that if they don't get involved, if they don't act, Nothing will change in their country. So on the one hand, you see this growing imperative of change, and they watched President Medvedev for four years, seemingly trying to introduce some of those changes that, that people wanted, and with so little success, with so, so little boldness. And then when they heard that Mr. Putin was returning, and that was the original plan, supposedly, uh, a sufficient number of people felt that they were they were done with it, that they could no or could take an alarm. I'm mad as hell, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and they began to demonstrate. <laughs> and uh, actually what we saw in, uh, uh, in those months was the fact that the Russian state is very rickety, very weak, because the fear that those massive demonstrations instilled in the minds of the ruling elite was really shocking. You could think that, oh yeah, these people are sitting, you know, sitting pretty, they control everything, you know, they can manipulate democracy and so on. And yet when you see sufficient numbers of people fearlessly demonstrating, demanding non-selection and things like that, they run scared. So the election of Mr. Putin uh, is uh, an interesting, it's not, it's not a return to Putinism of the 2000s. So the past decade. No, this is the start of a new stage in Russia's political evolution. Uh, the conservative phase is over, and uh, uh, Russia has over outgrown Putinism. It was a shell which allowed Russia to evolve and to recover to some extent, and now that shell is no longer fitting Russia. It has outgrown it. And uh, whether Putin, uh, it's a whole different topic, uh, and the topic of my talk is not the future of Putinism, but odds are that Mr. Putin will not be there for a long time. And if the only way that, ha that he can secure for himself at least one full term, and that's now six years uh, because of the changes in the Russian constitution, is to become an anti-Putin. And whether he can become an anti-Putin is, is highly questionable. So it's going, Russian politics is, is not going to be boring anymore. The Russians have awakened, uh, awakened and uh, there is a Russian proverb, never awaken a bear in winter. <laughs> I mean, in summer, the, the bear is not asleep, uh, doing all kinds of foraging, stuff like that. But when he's asleep and you awaken him, he's going to be mad as hell. 
A few figures uh, before I move on to the foreign policy issues. Look at this. Uh, compare the figures uh, uh, from 2007 with the current figures. What is happening in the country? Formation of an authoritarian regime. 2007, 13%. 2011, 16%. That's not a big change, but still, you know, more people are concerned about authoritarians. Establishment of order, that's what, that was kind of Putin's uh, slogan, we are establishing order in Russia. 42% uh, four years ago thought that order is being established. Now you have drastic decline in those numbers, 29%. Growing disorder and chaos. Now you hear you, you can see this jump from 14 to 26 percent. Concern that Russia is going to lose whatever semblance of order it had gained. So on the one hand, fewer people are seeing the establishment of order. On the other hand, they see the danger of chaos. And by the way, the reason why Putin won, I mean, some votes were added illegally, uh, probably five, six percent, but uh, it is that we have overwhelming evidence. Those of us who watch Russia and are in tune with what's going on in Russia was in the last month before the election, after January when Putin looked beatable, there was this swing of the undecided voters, about 15, 20 percent of people who were kind of tied to Putin and were looking with interest at the protesters and the opposition forces. And the more they looked, the less convinced they were that if they overthrow Putin and give the country to this diverse motley group of loud politicians, that they might have another period, maybe worse than what they had in the 1990s. And, and so they were saying, you know, for a while, uh, let Putin stay, but we'll kind of keep an eye on him. So now he will not be able to, he will have to uh, listen to what the people want to a greater degree than before, so it'll be a different Putin and so on and so forth. It's that swing vote. It's the undecided that decided the results of the election. So the opposition, if the opposition had been more credible, I mean, they already did unexpectedly much by, by shattering this shell called Putinism. But uh, they... Uh, fell short of the goal of replacing him, if only because they were not ready for that. The opposition itself was surprised uh, how people became agitated, how many people joined the political fight, and how <laughs> it was really surprising. They, they, they were not prepared for that role. Uh, they, they never expected to, to be so successful. Another poll, what is happening in the country? Uh, Growth and development, stabilization, slowdown, stagnation. Look at this. Growth and development, drastic decline from 2007. Stabilization, about the same. Slowdown, stagnation, drastic increase. So, you can easily see the shift of public opinion from perception that the country is growing, and that was very much the perception from the last decade, to the perception that the country is stagnating, it's stuck, it needs change, it needs to wake up. And this is the kind of mindset that uh, uh, was uh, manifested in those events. Uh, so, uh, let me move to foreign policy. Uh, you can discuss Russian foreign policy by comparing it in terms of a compass. A compass that can point in various directions. There is the West represented by the United States, Europe, NATO, uh, there's East, China in the first place, South, the Muslim world in India, and the North, the Arctic, increasingly important in the Russian foreign policy context. It's really interesting to look at the map of Russia from the various, uh, in terms of Russia being integrated with uh, uh, various parts of the world. Here is Russia as a European country. As you can see, the European presence of Russia is quite, quite massive. Here is Russia as an Asian country. It's the biggest Asian country. It's the biggest European country. It's the biggest Asian country. We keep forgetting that Russia is a big Pacific nation because roughly from uh, this point here, the Sea of Japan, all the way to the Bering Strait, this is the Pacific coast of Russia. Very sparsely populated. 
possessing tremendous resources and of increasing importance as the uh, ices of the uh, as the ice of the Arctic uh, is melting and uh, new maritime routes are uh, uh, are being developed. So it's a Pacific nation, it's a major Pacific nation, and it's also a major Arctic nation because it has more of the Arctic shoreline than any other country. Canada is number two in that regard. Uh, if you look at the political faces of Russia, uh, it's also interesting how diverse it is. Now, the medieval setup of the Kremlin is well known. It is a fortress. This is the center of Russia. This is Moscow, uh, meant to be the third Rome in the uh, words of the clerics of the 16th century. Uh, this is St. Petersburg. Uh, what a contrast. There's nothing medieval about St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is a modern European city, built as a statement of Russia's European modern identity, and remains, uh, it's, it's, it's a window to Europe, and it remains a window to Europe. But look at the third capital of Russia. Now, Russia has three capitals. I mean, it has one capital official, but two other cities uh, are allowed to call themselves capitals of Russia, and they are St. Petersburg and Kazan. Now, Kazan is the capital of the Republic of Tatarstan. There was a time when the princes of Moscow were uh, under the control of the Khans of Kazan. <coughs> that, that's at the time when Russia was not free. Uh, it was a, a tributary to the uh, uh, Tatar Mongol Empire. So the interesting thing about uh, the Kremlin, because it's also Kremlin, is that, as you can see, uh, it has uh, a huge mosque and a huge Orthodox cathedral within the walls of the Kremlin. Now, there's no mosque here. You have lots of cathedrals inside the Moscow Kremlin and Kazan because of the deep-seated Islamic identity and proud Islamic identity of the Tatars and the importance of Kazan in the history of, of, of Russia and of Tatars, you have <laughs> the coexistence of Islam and Orthodox Christianity within the walls of one, uh, one fortress. Uh, uh, I, I like this cartoon because uh, it kind of... Uh, conveys the, uh, some of the uh, mindset uh, that the Russians have. You know, on the one hand, you say, oh, Russia is huge and it has so many neighbors. But you can actually get uh, pretty paranoid about your neighbors uh, if you're not strong and, and if the neighbors are doing all kinds of things that, uh, that makes you uneasy. So uh, there's a way, uh, you know, for Russians to look at the outside world uh, where they are sitting inside a fortress and, uh, and uh, there are all kinds of uh, creatures uh, uh, around that fortress who are trying to get something of what the Russians had. When the Russians talk about the West, they mean several things. And it's important to keep in mind all those dimensions. First of all, since the times of Peter the Great, the West was associated, at first they were talking about Europe, of course, uh, but in the general sense, the West was associated with modernization. Europe was forging ahead with new ways in the economy and politics, society, and so on and so on. Russia was stuck in its medieval mode. So the gap between Russia and the West emerged, and uh, periodically Russia would make gigantic strides to type try and catch up with the West by transforming itself to one or another degree along the Western mode. And in the latest uh, attempt of that kind in the past 20 years, uh, Russia actually tried to remake itself in the Western mode in the most <coughs> decisive way by becoming a liberal capitalist country. Uh, at the same time, there was always, uh, on the one hand, the Russians want to emulate the West, on the other hand, there is always this other feeling, which is that actually the Russians might do things differently because the country is so different. And it remains to be seen which of the two models is better, the Russian model or the Western model. At the very least, if the Western model doesn't quite apply to Russia, maybe we can try something more homegrown. 
The second meaning is that uh, the West means the global capitalist system, the core of the global capitalist system, and Russia wants to be part of it. Uh, the triumph, the most, or rather the most recent achievement in this uh, movement toward integration with the West has been uh, Russia's admitt admittance to the World Trade Organization, something which uh, it's a really important marker. And uh, uh, it, uh, it, is, uh, it, it has taken several, quite a few years, about 15 years to achieve this. And the third meaning of the West, when the Russians talk about the West, they see Western countries and Western organizations as competing with Russia. Competing and uh, potentially threatening Russia. Because these are combinations of power which are separate from Russia. Russia does not belong and Russia may not be wanted in them. Nobody is inviting Russia into the European Union. Nobody is inviting Russia into NATO. I mean, NATO <laughs> spokesmen may say, oh, we don't mind. But, you know, there are conditions and, and then it becomes obvious that uh, uh, you know, Russia cannot, cannot be a member. Uh, the Russians also make distinctions about the West. Uh, uh, they, first of all, there are three Wests. There is the New West, the Middle West, and, and, and the Far West. The Far West, that's us here and the United States. First the United States, and then us here. Then there's the so-called Middle West, and that's Western Europe. And then there is the Near West, and these are former communist states which have been increasingly integrated uh, with NATO and, uh, and the European Union. But also, you know, the West is a big war, and when you are engaged in foreign policy, you deal with specific countries. So uh, it was a very important direction of Russian foreign policy with regard to the West that uh, uh, you deal with individual countries and it's in bilateral relations with countries like Germany, France, Italy that uh, the Russians have achieved the most the important uh, goals. In fact, they've been more successful in engaging on the individual basis than uh, with organizations such as NATO and the European Union. So. Given the fact that there is this compass and uh, there is a uh, determination of the Russians to maintain a balance between their engagements in the West and the East and the North and the South, still the West remains the most important uh, uh, direction of Russian foreign policy. There's no desire to confront the West, there is continuing desire to join the West, to integrate with the West. Uh, but at the same time, and especially in the past uh, 12, 13 years, increasing insistence that the terms of Russian engagement with the West must be more in line with Russian national interest. And uh, this insistence on national interests uh, has, of course, been uh, a source of frictions between uh, Russia and Western countries. Another source of friction is that Russia claims to have special interests in the post-Soviet space. Uh, it's absolutely uh, pointless to talk about a restoration of the Soviet Union. It's not going to happen. Or the Russian Empire. It's not going to happen. But some form of reintegration of countries which used to be independent states, which used to be republics of the Soviet Union, is likely to happen. And we shouldn't be particularly concerned about that. Those who are saying, oh, well, the, you know, the Russians are conquering you know, the, uh, this space again. Uh, for instance, when the West leaves Afghanistan, Central Asia might become an arena of uh, tremendously violent struggles for power. Central Asian states are not strong. Central Asian states need to be strengthened. The West cannot do so. Central Asian states can be secured and strengthened. Their, their modernization and development can be fostered if there is a cooperative engagement of other countries. And the countries which are, in a natural way, best situated to stabilize and strengthen these states are Russia and China. So, in fact, in the post-Soviet space, what is more likely to emerge is not the restoration of the Russian Empire, but rather uh, a kind of a dual, uh, uh, it's not a dominion, uh, uh, the, uh, 
uh, at any rate, Russia and China are already cooperating uh, in uh, competing and cooperating. Again, looking at it from the West, uh, there is a tendency to see only competition. You know, it's I'm really I've taken part in countless discussions on Russia-Chinese relations. Oh, and it always strikes me that there is a tendency among Western experts to look at what divides Russia and China, completely <laughs> forgetting that the things that actually put them together are much more important. And the fact that, that they have differences and the fact that they compete does not overshadow the fact that they work together on most issues. I would say that it's 70% cooperation, 30% competition. But what I'm saying is that uh, the uh, claim for special interests uh, can be made uh, in speeches and sometimes as good campaign rhetoric. But the fact is that we're dealing with a new reality. 15 independent states, uh, three of them, by the way, the Baltic states, are already members of NATO and the European Union. So they are not going to be reconquered by the way. Ukraine is not going to give up its uh, independence, but Ukraine is keen on maintaining a very close partnership with Russia. If only because that's where the money is. For Central Asia as well. If you think Canada is prepared to invest big money, or the United States, big money into the rebuilding of the machine tool industry in Uzbekistan, think again. The Russians do have the money. And it's the private sector that has that money. And they're keen on doing that, provided they have certain incentives. So uh, if there is a restoration of the Russian sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space, the main drivers are not military, they're not political, they're economic. That is the most important thing. There is, you know, uh, there's no ideology in Russian foreign policy, and that's perhaps one of the strongest points of it. Uh, it's entirely pragmatic to the point of being cynical. It's driven by very simple considerations of national interest, which is permeated with the considerations of trade and investment. Also security, of course, because that's... Uh, <laughs> what is a requirement if you are in charge of Russian foreign policy. So, uh, I've, uh, I think uh, I've kind of tested your uh, attention for much too long, uh, so I, I would like to wrap it up by observing that relations between Russia and the West <coughs> have become closer than at any time uh, in the history of Russia. Russia is more closely integrated with the West today than it has ever been. And uh, when you have, and you know, only 20 years ago, those were two competing systems, Russia, the Soviet Union, and the West. So when you see such a shift, inevitably it creates frictions because the two sides have never been so closely together. So part of the frictions and the differences and the flare-ups of uh, 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 conflict when we say, oh, another Cold War is coming. It's part of this accommodation which is going on. It's, a, it's going to be a longer process. That's one thing. The other thing is, we have to be realistic, is that the world is a highly competitive place. There is competition for influence, for markets, for access to energy, for prices. Do you know how the Russians and Chinese haggle over prices of things like oil and gas? They're building pipelines, the Chinese are financing big projects to have it, but, but they can, for years they can haggle over the price. And it's all out in the open. And then they embrace themselves and make a deal. So something similar is going on between Russia and NATO, between Russia and the European Union, and so on and so forth. So there are real differences between national interests, there is competition, there, there, there will be uh, heated debates, uh, uh, I observed very closely how the two ambassadors at the United Nations Security Council uh, interact. I'm talking about uh, Ambassador Churkin of uh, the Russian Federation and Ambassador Rice of the United States. And, uh, you know, they've been sparring over the issue of Syria uh, for weeks, if not months. And when you look at the expressions on their faces <coughs> when they go against each other, you may think that these people are about to kill each other, and they're, they're, so, they're so hostile. And then you look at how they, uh, you see how they look when they have lunch together afterwards. <laughs> you become kind of 
quaint uh, as to what goes on in the minds of the diplomats. So, uh, uh, how can I sum it up? I wouldn't like to, to leave you with the impression that I see relations between Russia and the West as cloudless, as improving, and so on and so forth. It can always go wrong as a result of policy mistakes, as a result of political changes in one country or the other. In particular, in the past year, we've seen, because of the Russian electoral campaign, the toughening of the anti-Western rhetoric in Russia. And we've seen, because of the Republican primary campaign, the toughening, the toughening of American rhetoric on, uh, on Russia. So if Mitt Romney becomes president, there will be a period when <laughs> the relations are likely to cool down. But only for a while. Because, uh, as uh, Obama put it in that eavesdrop conversation, remember that accidentally the mic was on and they were in Seoul and he was sitting on the stage with President Pizveri who was saying, yeah, you know, on this missile defense deal, you know, after the election will be a whole new ball game, so we will we'll work it out. You know, and you and I and Putin and I, tell Vladimir. <laughs> tell Vladimir. I mean, big bad Putin is Vladimir to Obama. <laughs> Who are they deceiving? I mean, so, it, you know, there's a th politics is theater. There's, we sometimes uh, confuse the show for what's really going on behind stages, behind the stage, uh, or behind the curtains. And uh, uh, so, it, it can go bad. Uh, this is a dangerous world and uh, unstable world. We and we we are not properly equipped to deal with the challenges that we collectively face. But I think that we've made tremendous progress in the past 20 years, and hopefully we can make more progress in the coming years. So, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.